Thank you for tuning in. My name is Brock Pagney. I'm a PhD student at Arizona State University, and I've been working in the Autism Brain Aging Lab directed by Dr. Blair Braden. Today I'm going to be talking about our project investigating some of the neural mechanisms of mindfulness therapy in autism with a specific focus on elucidating some of the neural correlates of self-reflection. Autism is a neurodevelopmental condition that typically manifests around two to three years old and persists throughout adulthood. And the Diagnostic Statistical Manual version five characterizes autism under two core symptom domains. The first domain is social communication difficulties. So this includes disinterest in social interaction, difficulty reading verbal and nonverbal cues, and also alexithymia, which is difficulty in identifying one's emotional state. The other domain is restricted and repetitive behaviors and interest, and this includes insisting on sameness, inflexibility regarding behavioral routine and cognition, and it also can include things like self-injurious behavior. There are two other areas that present difficulties in autism. The first being theory of mind, so the ability to infer mental, emotional, and intentional states of other people, and the other in self-reflection, so having awareness of one own, one's own mental and emotional states. And the simulation hypothesis suggests that in order to understand other people's minds, we must have awareness of our own mind in order to infer that information as well as to extrapolate. So today I'm going to be talking about self-reflection as a potential psychological and neural mediator of mood improvement in autism. And I'm also going to be talking about it as a transdiagnostic target. So there are known abnormalities in self-reflection and a number of different psychiatric conditions. So it's possible that this can be uh, a therapeutic target. And there are extremely high rates of mood core morbidity in autism. And these, this can include conditions like OCD, ADHD, anxiety, and depression. Depression is one of the most commonly reported co-occurring conditions in autism. And it's estimated to be at four times the rate of the general population. So these are just astronomically high rates of depression. And they're also linked to poor work-related outcomes lower rates of independence, lower wages, and increased rates of suicide. There's some early indications that depression risk in this population may increase with age. So it's really, really important to intervene on some of these co-occurring mood conditions because they really exacerbate some of the autism-related symptoms. One intervention that has been studied extensively in clinical and non-clinical populations is mindfulness-based stress reduction. So this is an eight-week evidence-based practice, uh, evidence practice. And a lot of the techniques that are taught have origins in Buddhism, which were then standardized by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center. And uh, this is an eight-week program. Participants meet for two hours each week. There's a one-day retreat as well as 45 to 60 minutes of daily practice. Uh, the intervention teaches present moment awareness. This includes things like directing attention towards the breath, bodily sensations, and also the arising of thoughts and emotions. And it's really encouraged to take an attitude towards uh, being non-judgmental and non-reactive towards the contents of consciousness. So MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, has been employed in a number of clinical and non-clinical populations uh, with a bulk of these studies showing that it outperforms active control conditions with small to moderate effect sizes. And two independent groups in the Netherlands have investigated MBSR in adults with autism and found that it reduces depression, anxiety, and rumination and that some of these benefits are sustained nine weeks after the intervention. In an extended 13-week MBSR program, 
putting cognitive behavioral therapy head to head with mindfulness based therapy found that both interventions improved depression, anxiety, and rumination, and that these positive effects uh, endured three months afterward. Uh, the authors did note that MBSR may be preferred for particular subsets of adults with autism uh, compared to cognitive behavioral therapy. So looking at some of the neural mechanisms underlying these therapeutic improvements that have been reported after mindfulness intervention, it appears that there are three main uh, potential mediators of therapeutic improvement. The first being altering the neural correlates of attention allocation. Uh, the second is altering neural correlates of introspection and self-awareness. And the third is altering emotional processing. So one of the main objectives of our lab is to characterize some of the neural changes that are underlying mindfulness intervention in this population. And uh, we've taken a particular focus in the neural mechanisms of self-reflection. So self-reflection can be defined as inward attention towards thoughts, memories, feelings, and actions. And Philippi and Koenig's proposed a model in which the relationship between well-being and self-referential uh, thinking is an inverted shaped U, such that conditions that have abnormally low levels of self-reflection, such as autism and psychopathology, lead to lower rates of well-being. Additionally, conditions in which excessive self-referential thinking occurs, characteristic of depression and anxiety, but also these conditions uh, show lower rates of well-being. And there are a number of reviews that suggest mindfulness may be mediating therapeutic effects by normalizing self-referential thinking. So this has really become a focus of our lab. And there was a beautiful meta-analysis done by George Northoff trying to identify what are some of the common brain regions that are involved in processing all sorts of information related to the self. And they found that a lot of the cortical midline structures, so namely the cingulate cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, seem to be involved in processing uh, all sorts of modalities uh, related to self-referential information. Additionally, looking at behavioral findings in major depressive disorder, uh, you see a negative attention bias, just meaning that uh, attention is biased towards processing negative self-related information, which is related to poor self-image. And also there's an excessive degree of self-referential thinking, which is clinically referred to as rumination. A meta-analysis that was done by Nahad, looking at 12 different studies, found that there were abnormalities in these cortical midline structures uh, during self-referential thinking. So this was really suggestive that uh, these may be uh, regions involved in uh, depression, depression symptomology. Uh, in autism spectrum disorder, there are known abnormalities in self-referential processing as well. So in neurotypical people, you tend to see a memory effect where we remember things better when we're processing them in relation to ourselves relative to other people. And this memory, enhanced memory effect is impaired in autism. There are also the deficits in psychological awareness, such as alexithymia that I mentioned previously. And you also see decreased use of first person pronoun use. There are a number of neuroimaging studies suggesting that altered functional connectivity and uh, brain activation may underlie some of these issues with self-referential processing. And one seminal study done by Michael Lombardo and Simon Baron Cohen of Cambridge found altered activity in the middle cingulate in autism. So they had participants reflect upon themselves and reflect upon a close person that they knew. And they found that neurotypical adults preferentially activate this region when reflecting on themselves. Contrarily, adults with autism preferentially activated this region when thinking about other people. 
They also found abnormalities in activation of the medial prefrontal cortex and found that the degree of activation in this region correlated with social symptom severity in autism. So this is a really, really influential study. Uh, it influenced our regions of interest for our mindfulness study. So in regards to that, we collected two cohorts of 30 to 40 adults for a final sample of 59. The primary results I'm going to be presenting today are just with the first cohort, and then I'll present some preliminary behavioral findings uh, with the addition of the second cohort. So all participants meet an autism diagnosis according to the autism diagnostic, diagnostic observation schedule. They have an IQ above 70. They are 18 years or older. They have no known medical history of drug abuse and no uh, history of concussion that has resulted in loss of consciousness. All participants were randomly assigned to either the mindfulness-based stress reduction or the support education. The support education group met for the same amount of time or eight consecutive weeks. And this group discussed relaxation techniques recommended by NCCIH. It really was intended to control for social interaction and the educational piece uh, that was included in the mindfulness intervention. We had participants complete pre and post questionnaires assessing depression and anxiety, as well as do an fMRI self-reflection task. So looking at group differences in our first cohort, we found no differences in the mindfulness group or the support education group in regards to their age, their IQ, autism severity, or the number of classes attended. However, there was a significant group difference in the male to female ratio. And we were able to replicate those findings from the two groups in the Netherlands, finding that MBSR significantly reduced depression. And looking at individual change scores, we see that a subset of the MBSR group moved from clinical categories of depression to subclinical categories of depression. So this is really exciting. And uh, really the main objective of our lab is to characterize some of the neural substrates. So we use a self-reflection task. So participants are put into the scanner and this task consists of two conditions. The first is referred to as the self condition. And the stimuli presented on the screen are I am, followed by a trait adjective. These trait adjectives include physical, emotional, and mental traits and the participants respond yes or no as to whether they possess that trait. And the word condition asks them if the word is positive, so really controlling for evaluation and making a judgment, as well as processing the balance of various trait adjectives. So to validate that our task was working, we just looked at uh, the neural correlates of self-reflection at baseline and found that some of the uh, cortical midline structures that have been reported in the literature were indeed activated in this task. These include the posterior cingulate cortex or the PCC, the anterior cingulate cortex or ACC, the MPFC. So next we wanted to use that region of interest approach to see if we were altering the middle cingulate cortex or the medial prefrontal cortex as was shown in that uh, seminal Lombardo paper. We found that the mindfulness group showed significant increases in the middle cingulate cortex. Uh, these changes were not found in the support education group, and we found no changes in activation in the medial prefrontal cortex. Next, we did a seed to voxel functional connectivity analysis where we used the middle cingulate cortex as a seed, and we were curious if any brain regions were becoming more less functionally connected to this region. We found that the MBSR group, but not the support education, showed significant increased functional connectivity with primary motor and primary somatosensory cortices. So this was really exciting. We're seeing functional connectivity changes on top of changes in just activation. 
And the literature in major depressive disorder uh, suggested that there is hyperconnectivity between the middle cingulate and the medial prefrontal cortex. So we wanted to assess connectivity between these two regions. We used a ROI to ROI analysis and found decreased functional connectivity between the middle cingulate and the MPFC in the mindfulness group, but not in the support education group. So these were really exciting findings. And next we wanted to see if these changes really corresponded with improvements in mood. So we took the region, the metal cingulate cortex activation values and ran a correlation analysis and found that participants who had the greatest reductions in depression also showed greater activity in the middle cingulate cortex. So this is potentially suggesting the middle cingulate is a neural correlate of therapeutic improvement after mindfulness training. And these results are, have been recently published in this pilot study uh, as of this year. So this is, these were really exciting findings. And to put them in the context of the literature, uh, there are known abnormalities and connectivity between the middle cingulate and the uh, sensory motor cortex and the direction of the functional connectivity changes that we're seeing uh, suggest that we're moving in a normative direction. And really trying to put these, these uh, findings in a theoretical framework, uh, the mindfulness training program is really oriented towards paying attention to the body. And uh, we thought it was interesting that we're recruiting sensory motor regions uh, during a self-reflection task. So we called upon some theories in embodied cognition, which suggests that sensory motor systems are, are really, really critical to higher order functions such as self-reflection. So we think that might be what is going on, increased body awareness, altering uh, self-awareness, and also our changes in the middle cingulate and MPFC connectivity uh, are really suggestive of moving in a normative direction uh, when compared to patients with major depressive disorder. However, these functional connectivity analyses don't allow us to infer directionality. So we don't know what direction these functional connectivity, uh, connectivity changes are moving in. Is the middle cingulate cortex signaling to the medial prefrontal cortex or vice versa, more or less, things of that nature. So since analyzing these data, we've collected a second cohort and with the addition of this cohort, I found no group differences in the male to female ratio, as well as in age, IQ, or autism severity. And just looking at symptoms of depression and anxiety, we're now seeing that both interventions are significantly improving symptoms of depression and anxiety. So this is just really suggestive that these might be non-intervention specific improvements. We're also finding uh, mindfulness specific improvements in disability related quality of life, where the mindfulness group is showing significant improvements in regards to quality of life. Also improvements in executive functioning measures, such as inhibition and also in initiation, initiating, which isn't shown here. And we're also seeing improvements in emotional reactivity which makes sense given that the training is really to take a non-judgmental, non-reactive attitude towards the contents of awareness. And we're seeing reductions in repetitive motor behaviors. So a symptom of autism. So this is really exciting. It suggests that they are non-specific and specific effects of mindfulness. And a goal of our lab is to combine some of these fMRI data sets with EEG measures, which we've also collected to improve our ability to predict depression reduction. So this is really moving towards personalized medicine. And today I've primarily talked about self-reflection, some of the neural correlates of it. Uh, we're also collecting data, EEG data, looking at electrophysiological markers of emotion regulation. In addition to resting state fMRI data, looking at intrinsic brain connectivity and how that relates to improvements in depression. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and give a huge shout out to everyone in the lab who's been instrumental to collecting and analyzing these data. 
And a big thank you to my advisor, Dr. Blair Braden, uh, all the MBSR facilitators, and I've added my email at the bottom if you'd like to contact me with any questions or comments. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Hi. I'm going to speak a little bit about consciousness in uh, terms of meditation and healing and how it relates to specific areas of the brain, namely the amygdala and the hippocampus that are themselves in the frontal and medial portion of the temporal lobe on both sides of the brain. A little bit about myself. My name is Michael Cooch. I am 56 years old this month. Uh, my formal education is in engineering. I have a master's in systems and a bachelor's in electrical. I currently work for the Department of Defense here in Arizona on Fort Huachuca at the Joint Interoperability Test Command. If not at work, I'm spending all of my time outdoors raising two young ladies, a mixed boxer ridgeback named Grace and a Catahoula leopard named Lila. Today, I'm talking about expanding consciousness and living in the present, purely, and having a lifetime relationship with healing, living the truth, which enables and grows genuine health. What brings me here today as an expert of the mind is a first-hand experience with how the mind works with and without the left hemisphere as normally constructed. To be able to talk about this, I myself had a partial a temporal lobectomy on 6 2013 uh, This was done by Dr. Martin Winan here at Banner uh, University Medical Center in Tucson. We will go over medicine, the actual parts removed and their functionality, the effect on consciousness, and uh, what I believe enabled the outcome to be so terrific. All to offer you insight for yourself on exercising choiceless awareness. To be immersed in the adventure of knowing the brain, on 11 October 1975, I had my first car accident while I lived in the Netherlands with the Dutch Boy Scouts uh, in Oosgeest. We were crossing the street on our bikes, and I was slow with keeping up with the big guys, and uh, I, I was hit on the right side. I did have a short period of amnesia. There was no signs of contusio cerebri. Uh, this is a form of traumatic brain injury, uh, which is bruising on the brain tissue. The diagnosis at the time was commodio cerebri, a blow to the brain without ad other adverse effects. I began to have epilepsy about a year later. When I was 11 years old, beginning with a grand mal seizure in the morning when I was waking up. I was started on medicine, uh, still to have complex partial seizures for the whole duration of having epilepsy. Medicine dulled performance for me, and thus agility of my being alive. I uh, wouldn't have ever said that during the 37 years of taking the medicine, but after surgery was stopping it. Wow. Wow. Over and over. Wow. The medicines that I took were Dilantin, uh, Tegretol, and Lamictal. In 1976, I started with Dilantin, uh, and I took it for 15 years until 1991. Dilantin slowed the impulses in my brain that caused seizures. After this, I took Tegretol for 21 years, which dampened signal flow within my central nervous system and caused memory loss. Then following a second car accident in 2012, while riding my bike to work, I became involved with uh, neurology at the University of Arizona, and I began to take Lamictal, which also causes central nervous system damping and memory loss. Having taken the three medicines with no complete control of petite malls and becoming older, I decided to go through the evaluation process of becoming a candidate 
of what became a seven-plus-hour temporal lobectomy by Dr. Martin Winan. It was a very, very successful operation. I remember sitting in the waiting area with my dad that morning at Banner University Medical Center for my surgery to begin, or the process of getting me ready for it. And I was completely relaxed, like we were just together and living in the present. I wonder, who was my trainer for being able to relax so well? With my pathology after surgery, it found the temporal lobe uh, brain tissue uh, had superficial gliosis, which is a scarring, uh, but no other pathological chain. A good medical word for what the temporal lobectomy created for me, euphoria forever, bliss and happiness, nonstop. And today the only thing that has changed with this is that I'm so used to it. And I've gotten better and better at rounding off situations where people play games with the truth that then creates friction and impacts my way of life today uh, to kind of upset the teacup, in other words. Uh, you could call this a special need now after surgery. It is an interesting experience to be aware of, and we all get it, but we're not so aware of the fixed boundary that disallows the flow and the expansion of our consciousness until we are unplugged. The electrical fence around me was gone after surgery. It was unplugged. <laughs> I didn't need to feel tense anymore with the potential of conflict, of going on into the unknown as uh, there was is no other direction versus the programmed way of operation. I was no longer on a leash. This limitation that we live with, I would say, comes entirely from living and coordinating with human beings. After surgery, I was no longer such a requiring dependent, living relationships with humans, but instead dancing with the cosmos in their place. Without medicine and with surgery, awareness and sensitivity took off like a wildfire. I experienced a combined effect enlightenment. By removing scarred working parts of the left temporal lobe, no longer taking medicine, and then being able to be comfortably free of human program routines to do things. Left now on a surfboard on a roaring wave, unending forever. All that I'm sensing, especially with my eyes, is like it's happening for the first time, every time. While I know that it's not, for example, with my going on back to work, every day was and still is like my very first when I walk up to the front door. My perception was much enhanced uh, to create my own reality uh, to become much closer to actuality. Long-term memory today adds more flavor than ever, but does not at all drive me in terms of the choices that I make. After surgery, I was no longer automated, and uh, but a freewheeling Michael Cooch, like a super artist or an outdoorsman that's always living in the unknown and not afraid of death. So just a brief review from my own experience on how the left versus the right hemisphere of the brain work together and perform their design jobs. From my having and not having, the left temporal hemisphere uh, has so much to do with logistics and rules, routine and structure, and for operating in an autopilot mode. Uh, many people today go around operating this way, just because it's been learned by being easy. And uh, if you make yourself outstanding and different, you then invite friction with other people's understanding of you. It's, it's not easy to be different, believe me. And so we don't do it often uh, to put your foot down just out of the blue and say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just because we are put then more to be on our own, singled out, just because you bring conflict and uncomfortableness, at least at first for others. 
While having a difference of thought and disagreement feels rough, uh, well, it's very, very healthy, though, for really learning and expanding consciousness. As Joseph Campbell points out, out in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. So the left is all about avoiding conflict and working with routine, relating to some team's way of doing business uh, without question, for example, your family, and not traveling into the unknown. Now the right, by itself, is purely about relativity, flow, and creativity, and operating in terms of spontaneity. This is what Wu Wei is all about, effortless action. The left and the right are meant to be connected and to dance together, and each at their own fullest of performance. Where instead in the world today, the left never asks the right to dance, and uh, much because it's unlearned in dancing. And to the left hemisphere, the right always seems worthless. It sounds a bit like the ego is harbored in the left hemisphere of the brain from my experience. We are led to believe this each step of the way while working with people as soon as we pop out of the womb. And uh, this is not so with nature and animals, other animals besides being a human, as well as young children who are still flexible themselves, who all realize without words that we are all connected. Not just medicine was removed as a variable from the equation for me, but the mind's whole construction and the reorganization of it was restarted fresh without an engineer anymore to drive the train at all. The animal in me had now a wide open playing ground to relax in for real and creative healing of the brain and the mind with the growing of expansion to keep up with at the same time as all this goes on, just like what it feels when, like when you're born, over and over. For the first four to five years, it was all about rearranging and compensating for the loss of functionality that was caused, either good or bad, by what was removed with surgery. At the same time, not being very educated myself about the mind, functionally or psychologically, to be able to understand uh, the same person that I had been for 37 years for everyone else was gone. And how to now work with what I had left. How to talk about it. How to understand it. Of course, I was on it like a special project, <laughs> which helped a whole lot. In the left temporal lobe, I had taken out the superior, middle, and the inferior temporal gyrus, uh, the fusiform gyrus, the parahinal and interhinal cortex, the perihippocampal gyrus, the amygdala, and the uh, anterior portion of the hippocampus. Uh, this for me was a big test. And I'd say as a teacher and a student, I passed with an A+. <laughs> the two parts for myself that I have focused on understanding are the amygdala and the hippocampus. So briefly, from my own insight and first-hand experience, the amygdala is all about a raw processing of sensation produced from outside and inside of ourselves as it's directly related to the emotions tied to the variations in our senses and their relativity. Just like a professional team that is on the ground, the playing field together is a unit and is in action without thinking about anything at all. It's all about emotional response and memory processing for the formation of all of our long-term memory. The amygdala is all about our emotional relationships and with sensation and our sensory memory. We, are all, uh, ha we all handle emotions uh, differently as they occur, which gets on into understanding the responsibility of the hippocampus. But to put a hold on that. In the amygdala, we have templates uh, and uh, or ensembles of neuron arrangements that uh, correlate with our own personal emotional experiences and relationships of interrelating with the world 
uh, inside and outside of the bag of the skin that we wear and we're in. We have all exercised and trained these ensembles in our workshop on our playing field of the amygdala ever since coming into the world. And with what we have crafted then as being hard to change and because of long-term memory. And instead we build on top of it as it's played to re make reinforcements. It sounds then again a bit like what happens with the development of the ego. The hippocampus is all about spatial but not emotional coaching and management of the context for the emotional energies of the amygdala to provide structure on the playing field. So the left hemisphere is all about managing routine and the right is all about coaching high performance. For myself, with my MRI that was before surgery, we saw that I did have a small left hemisphere hippocampus. So with a coach and a manager hippocampus for me that are meant to work together, I had a manager that was not such a good one to be able to fulfill its complete responsibility in its own area with the regula regulating the left amygdala while also working together with the hippocampus on the right, on, on the right hemisphere at the management coach level as a team. What made the surgery successful is having, I think, a high quality, quality way of life growing up rather than just living status quo uh, with routine rules uh, and with the former being able to be directly involved with creating the experience myself. Emotions then were not hinged on right and wrong, but on the raw truth as it lived. This requires a lot of sampling taken uh, of what people usually think is the same old thing or boring. And I think we've all seen that ourselves, boredom. I live in the world of the present. I lived there then and I live there now. There is no change. Realizing from an early age that I had to let go of holding on to anything and instead live with the spontaneous flow. Mom was and is today at 89 uh, a moving target. She was my co continuous and unquestioned point of reference as I grew up. Uh, this was critical, I think, in my development and for a really good outcome in surgery. I was well prepared. None of us are old enough, I don't think, but we can imagine what it was like in World War II when your town was bombed over and over. Once it happened so many times, it doesn't phase you in the same way, and you learn to relax and coordinate with what you have to work with to stay alive. And it makes a big impression on the rest of your life, the way you look at the world. With seizures focused out of the left hemisphere of my brain, it was very similar for me, like when the bombs hit. I relaxed over and over for so many years, like it was no big deal. For me, there never was a healthy reconstruction, and because the left temporal lobe and the rest of my body was bombed again weekly, bombed again and again. So as far as structure rules and logistics after age 11, I never developed much of what adults do as they form their ruts as a way of life and being who they are in terms of long-term memory, which determines how they operate. Again, the ego. With organizing reason and fitting in, I've always had to take fresh samples of what goes on and create structure on the fly for myself, ending up more real-time, more real-time and thus accurate, compared to being based upon long-term memories, where we have much deletion, distortion, and generalization of actuality. I was well composed to have the left hemisphere to be retired with surgery. I always think, I always think of the song called The Monkey and the Engineer, written by Jesse Fuller. If you know of how the song goes, the engineer stepped out of the train to get a bite to eat. He left the monkey sitting on the driver's seat. The monkey pulled the throttle, the in locomotive jumped the gun, and did 90 miles an hour down the main line run. And the monkey did a great job at bringing the train on in. 
A kidding but serious question brought up to me in December 2018 uh, by the class that I, I talk with for exam preparation, their first year medical students, with a review, a review of epilepsy in the amygdala was why can't we all get a temporal lobectomy? Well, <laughs> we are all different. I didn't have an answer then. And that's why I'm here. Well, we are all different and special with how we have developed our minds. And not everyone is ready to leap off the edge and become immersed in the unknown instantly. But this question has really stuck with me on a better being able to begin to answer it, to give insight. And the center of consciousness seemed like a really great place to try this out. Um, and for the fun of it. And then I was accepted to speak by Abhi. So here I am. <laughs> it is a very similar question. Why can't we all reference the coronavirus like it's just a bad dream and properly prioritize it when we wake up? The catch-all goes back to being like everyone else and fitting in like we best know. And we've been trained. It's a big decision to reorganize the logistics of life to drop the prioritization of human rules and reasoning. We're all humans with all the got tos and these being able to carry so much weight in terms of the decisions that we make. Everything that we think isn't really as important as we make it. And in order to play the games that go on with people to be accepted, it's instead more of an addiction to thinking about thinking, about thinking, about what stimulates us and makes us feel comfortable versus healthy. Trust the monkey in you in the right hemisphere of the brain and give it more responsibility to manage your performance and relax to learn a new way of living based on living ter in terms of the truth which is spontaneous, flowing, and dynamic. Get on into the outdoors and listen to the animals. Listen to you and realize they really there really isn't any separation at all between you and the cosmos. So, so what do you take away with you? Instead of having a left temporal lobectomy that instantly gets you into living consciousness or and with choiceless awareness, relax. Relax. Relax and love yourself, which is a growing process of actuality or an actualizing what yourself with a capital Y really means. And this is expanding consciousness to live without entrapments like the coronavirus or anything else that humans come up with blown way out of proportion, which is very, very normal. Relax and let the extent of who you are wake up every morning and bloom with every breath in to have a complete rhythm to dance through the day until you close your eyes. Remember, the right hemisphere is all about the essence of good proportions. Strengthen it. Relax. <laughs> and then again, bring it to strength. This is what meditation is all about. Hello, everyone. My name is Garrett Yant, and it is my privilege today to share with you a little bit about a pilot study that the whole team of scientists at my institute came together to pull off. And we are from the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and the name of the, of the study we call it Measuring Effects of Biofield Therapies in the Laboratory, a pilot study focusing on pain alleviation. So let me get everybody started by just orienting you to the design of the pilot study. So we had subjects who were seeking relief from pain come up to our campus, and each one of them experienced one single energy medicine or biofield therapy session, a 30-minute session. And I'll use biofield therapy and energy medicine interchangeably during this talk. So we took measurements immediately before the therapy session 
immediately after the therapy session. And then the folks went home, lived their lives for three weeks, and came back to our campus for follow-up measures. So this was a prospective within subject design. And there was no control condition in this pilot study. So this means that all of the subjects received authentic treatment. As I said, the goal was pain alleviation. So this was our primary outcome measure. Everything was designed to look for pain alleviation. The measurement was a standard clinical tool. It's a scale of self-report questionnaire and a scale of zero to 10, with 10 being the worst pain and zero being no pain. To try to keep the subject population as homogeneous as possible, we, subject, we, we just had subjects come who had carpal tunnel syndrome wrist pain or hand and wrist pain. Now we were unable to have the subjects be screened by a, uh, by a clinician. So this was people who were, were self-reporting that they had hand and wrist pain. So the practitioners, we had a wide range of practitioners involved. And the criteria that we used to, to recruit them were number one, had to provide exceptional professional referrals. They also had to um, have experience working with pain specifically. And not only that, but believe that they could reduce pain in just one session. Additionally, they had to be willing to reside on our campus for a week and during that week, be able to deliver uh, sessions to approximately 10 subjects. And then they had to be willing to remain seated during the first and the last six minutes of the therapy session. And this was because we had them hook, hooked up with electrodes to measure um, heart rate. And to get clean data, um, we asked them to just remain still and seated now, in the middle of the session, they could get up and walk around and wave their hands and such. Um, but in order to have clean data, we asked them to, to, um, to remain seated and still. This is just one of, a, of, a, of many kind of parameters we asked them to, to kind of change their normal style in order to standardize the delivery as much as possible. Um, so this was one of the big questions in the pilot study was, if we asked them to, to kind of act in a way that wasn't normal, would they still be able to have effective treatment? So we had 17 practitioners in total. So I'm going to go through the quickly what some of those, what the modalities were. It was Shakti's, Barber Brennan method, Reiki, Rosalind Briere method, clairvoyant healing, Bankston energy healing method, healing touch, Peruvian shamanic healing, psychokinetic healing. Channeling energy of ascended masters, calling in Holy Spirit, quantum healing, exponential intelligence, pranic healing, quantum touch, chrysantha healing, and psychic manipulation of auras. This was quite a range. So they did end up uh, treating about 10 subjects each over the period of nine months. We were able to work with 190 subjects, it went through all of the protocol and it came back for the three week follow up. So it was a rather large pilot study. The demographics, a quick look, age, average age was around 54, mostly female, mostly Caucasian. This was indicative of the local area where we're recruiting from around our institute. Now the, 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 um, the sorry. The sessions took place inside of an electromagnetic shielded room. So it's basically a room with steel walls big enough for people to go into. This is a view inside of it, the three chairs. Of course, we gave the comfortable chair in the middle to the subjects so they could recline a bit and chill out during their, their session. This chair to the right is for the practitioners. Again, they were seated there. Here are some of the wires waiting to be stuck onto them. There's some other devices here, I'll mention later a laptop. And then here's another chair. This was, was uh, for one of our other measurement devices, this time in the form of a human. So we had a clairvoyant seer sitting there witnessing all 190 sessions, taking notes quietly, and attempting to perceive subtle energies um, 
as one of our measurements. So this is an example of one of the notes she took during the healing. And another job she had was to clear the energy in the room between each of the sessions. And she used a ritual clearing. And uh, part of that was using this product called Clean Sweep. So let's get right to the results. You may think that this, I chose this picture because of the feeling of release from pain, but it's really my reaction to the fact that we got very, very strong pain relief. This is a graph showing the average of all subjects. Before the session, coming in, they were all had pain at a level around four. It dropped below two immediately after the session. And then three weeks later, it still was down. This is about a 20% drop which is clinically significant. It's also um, statistically significant within the study. And keep in mind that this is um, after a single session. So three weeks later, still having these very positive effects um, on pain reduction. So I was quite elated at this result. So now moving on from our primary measure, which was pain alleviation, we also looked at a number of secondary measures. And I'm going to present just the outline of those here, breaking them down into three categories, psychological, physiological, and environmental. So psychological measures included pain interference, expectancy and belief, well-being, transformation, and connectedness. Physiological measures included nerve conduction velocity, heart rate variability, heart rate synchrony, and gene expression. And finally, the environmental secondary measures included water evanescence, magnetic field, water pH, quantum number generator was in the room, and also perceived subtle energy. So this was the, the clairvoyant seer's notes. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna give everybody a little spoiler alert and uh, tell you which of these secondary measures yielded significant results. So here they are. We saw very provocative results looking at pain interference, well-being, connectedness, heart rate variability, water evidence, and perturbations with the quantum number, uh, quantum number generator, quantum noise generator. So let's dig into a little bit of these results, starting with pain interference. Pain interference is an important aspect of pain, not just the physical sensation of it, but how it affects your life. So for example, if your wrist hurts and you can't pick up your grandchild, that has a very significant impact on people's lives. So the numbers for these came out uh, remarkably uh, significant. So both looking at how does pain interfere with normal life, with your relationships, and with your enjoyment of life. So we looked just at three weeks instead of just, you know, so before we didn't ask this question right after the session because they didn't have a chance to go live their life yet. But at three week follow up, we asked them to rate this and the numbers went down quite significantly. So again, I was hopping around in the, the field feeling gleeful about this as these people were. Let's move on to expectancy and belief. So um, we were interested to ask this because um, these, to ask something about this related to if, if it could tell us if it was placebo going on here or not. So some of these people knew about energy medicine or biophotherapy. Some of them had never heard of it before. Some of them thought it was uh, a lot of hocus pocus. So this might impact the way that the, the efficacy came through. And so it was nice to see that this did not correlate. We could not see significant correlation between the degree of pain relief and their expectancy. For their their belief. So now moving on to well-being and transformation. So for well-being, we asked them this question. I feel like I have positively changed as a result of this session. So they had to rate this on a scale of one or a zero to one hundred, with one hundred definitely true. So almost the the result was about seventy. So this is a pretty high, high score um, for a 30 minute session in terms of feeling positively changed. Now we asked if, if during that session, was there any moment of clarity or profound insight during the session? And 67% of the subjects said yes. And then of those, we asked, 
if this moment of clarity or profound insight, do you think it will change your behavior or relationships in the future? And again, they had to rate this uh, from zero to 100. And the result, the average was 72. So a moment of clarity or insight during a 30 minute biofield therapy session, these people felt that it was gonna impact their relationships in the future, impact their behavior in the future. Let's move on now to connectedness. So this, this is a picture of what the questionnaire looks like. They begin with uh, asking about, if you consider the circle as nature and the circle as yourself, use the cursor to drag those to the position where you feel like your level of connectedness is with nature. So they had to do this for nature and self, and they had to do it for others and self. So, um, you know, here's an example if they had put them completely over top of each other, feeling that there's no difference between myself and others. So these results um, were quite, quite strong as well. Um, this, this was taken pre-post. Now this post was immediately following the session. So we got very significant results in terms of people feeling more connected with nature and more connected with others. And also there's the Cloninger self-transcendence scale. Um, and there was a very strong response with that as well. So now let me move on to water evanescence. And I wanna take a little more time to talk about this because that's not immediately clear what this means. So I'll start with why were we looking at water evanescence? And it's because there was a, a paper already published in 2015 by Steven Schwartz and colleagues. And they were working with therapeutic touch practitioners, which is the same, you know, also in the same category of biofield therapies or energy medicine. And in their study, they had a vial of water taped to the hand of these therapeutic touch practitioners. And they saw a very interesting shift in the properties of water. And they were using a method called multi-bounce attenuated total reflection Fourier transfer form infrared spectroscopy. So this is a pretty fancy machine. And what it does is it sends a beam of infrared light, a fraction of a micron into the surface of water. And there, this reflects multiple times between the water and the crystal. What results is an evanescence wave. So this light produced is called an evanescence wave. And this wave is absorbed by resonance with the vibrations in the water's molecular bonds. So this, this resulting absorption spectrum that you get is, is uh, what we're, we're looking for. And this reveals information about the molecular structure of water. So it's an, it's an attempt to look at the level of the molecular structure of water, whether this energy medicine or biofield therapy is having an impact on the water. So we wanted to do this basically to have water there as a witness. And one of the ways we did it was to have a, a lanyard around the, the neck of the practitioners and hanging from that were two vials of water, one with Fiji water and one with distilled water. And so before going into the shielded room, Technicians would take a little aliquot of the water out of the tubes, run it through the fancy spectrophotometer. Then they would, they would wear this lanyard, this water necklace, and it would into the shielded room and it would be there during the whole energy medicine session, basically as a witness. Afterward, it would come out and again, a technician would take a couple aliquots out of the water necklace and run it through the machine again. So, the absorption spectrum looks like this. So the red line is before the healing and the blue line is after the healing. And here is the point in the spectrum where the, the paper by Stephen Schwartz and colleagues had seen the difference. And we saw the same difference. And this is a, quite a, a striking shift. It's visible by eye and it's also um, quite significant. Um, so this was exciting to see this corroboration with the previous work. And it's basically, what this means is it, it kind of suggests that the biofield therapies 
correlated with a change in the hydrogen oxygen covalent bonds. Um, and the way in which it's shifted, you can, you can think of it as it's stretching the bonds. So this is exciting physical manifestation, very objective measure. Not sure exactly what it means, but it's very interesting that it's um, has been now, we found it uh, independently in this other lab. So I'm gonna stop there and say my thank yous. Uh, as I mentioned, our entire team of scientists at IONS took place in this. We had wonderful people helping us out. And then I wanna say a special thanks to all the 17 practitioners. And a big thank you to the funders of the study, Emerald Gate Charitable Trust, who had the vision not only to, to support work in this field, but to do it at a significant scale so that we were able to work with nearly 200 subjects um, as opposed to uh, the pilot states I've been involved with before were more like 20. So this was very exciting to, to be able to really dig out as much feasibility data as we could. And um, we're looking forward to following up on this many interesting results, um, hopefully other labs as well. I hope it inspires many lines of research in this area. So, and there is my contact information. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Behrouz Ratnasab, and today I'm here with some of my friends, Afshin Azadeh and Mushin at Cosmo Intel, and we're gonna go over one of the most recent studies we've done at Cosmo Intel, which is the effect of Faradarmani consciousness field on the survival and death of breast cancer, MCF7 cells. As has been pointed out in the most empirical and research studies, the nature of consciousness, its location and its mechanism of action at the level of human are unknown. Examining its nature in philosophy, the flow of experience at different levels of individual and social life in psychology, its creation during information processing at network level of the nervous system, neurotransmitters and other processes of cerebral cortex in cognitive neurology are the most common field of studies and published literature. The explanation of consciousness at the level of wave function and its reduction in quantum physics and biology is one of the newest approaches in, the, in basic science to this concept. Looking at consciousness as an abstract process separate from objective material processes has been termed the hard problem of consciousness according to Chalmers' approach. An issue that has been addressed in various studies with different approaches in which consciousness is generally analyzed rather than individually in the global dimension. Approaches close to the criteria with non-physical field attribution to the consciousness have been seen in Sheldrake, Radin, Nelson, and some other published literature experiments. Here in this, present, in, in this approach, we are using uh, the approach that uh, Mr. Tahiri introduced, which is called uh, uh, consciousness field. And it is also non-material and non-energetic. The assumption put forward in this method is that the universe as a whole is a network of data gathering intelligence and everything is under that intelligence that is working and living. And it is called Cosmic Consciousness Network. In this study, we are, we are looking at it at the, at the tra traceability and behavior of living cells in a growth control environment and the influence of uh, on which is one of the consciousness field introduced by Mr. Tahiri on M MCF7 cancer cell line. Uh, we are talking about it. At uh, this point, I am asking my, my colleague, Nusheen, I know it's your, it's your field of study, so please go on and talk about the, uh, the detail of the, the study. Sure, I can do that, um, but do you want to do the consciousness? Field oh, sure, yeah. Test? Yeah, we, we used, we used the, the method of application of consciousness field that we used was in a laboratory and for the double blindness of uh, this, this study that you can, you can find the whole uh, description of it in uh, our website, cosmointel.com slash assign dash study dash intervention. And uh, just to mention that uh, um, the, the laboratory assistant 
they didn't know about the, the subject of the study that we've been, uh, we were using consciousness field. And also the one who was, uh, who was announcing this field, he or she didn't know that the subjects are cancer cells. Okay, so in the laboratory, uh, we use two main cell and molecular biology techniques to study cell behavior um, under Farad Harmony consciousness field. So one of the methods involves uh, assessing whether the cells showed any cytotoxicity using MTT assay. And another one is using flow cytometry to uh, examine cell cycle uh, distribution. So in the first case, um, the, uh, the cells, the MCF7 cells were uh, plated in a 96 well plate and were treated with MTT reagents um, for five minutes. Uh, after two hours, they were screened for MTT um, uh, uh, solubilized, uh, crystal solubilized MTT um, uh, using microwell plate readers. Uh, for the cell cycle analysis, uh, cells were either not treated uh, or treated with doxorubicin, which is an agent that um, I, uh, in inhibits proliferation of cells and uh, induces DNA damage. Uh, in another uh, experiment, they used a positive control using FBS treatment and one with Faraday money. So in the next slide, as you can see, um, after, so the cells are being monitored for 6, 18, and 12 hours. In the negative control cells, the cells are doing what cancer cells do. They grow really fast. Uh, in the second panel, under doxorubicin, the cell cycle uh, was reduced significantly by 24 hours. Uh, with the FPS positive control, again, the cells grow uh, like cancer cells. And under Faraday money, there was a 10% reduction in uh, cell proliferation. And this is, uh, was confirmed with MTT assay and also with Facts. So th this is now showing our facts analysis. On the top, you see the MCS7, MCF7 cells treated with doxorubicin, second panel uh, with FB FBS, and third panel with paradharmony. So the next slide shows the um, quantification of the cell cycle phases in each of these treatments. So as you can see in the uh, bottom uh, graph, there is uh, an, an increase in the red, which is the G0, G1 phase of cell cycle. That, that means under doxorubicin. So th the cells in this phase are uh, being apoptotic or they are undergoing cell death. Um, and as you can see with Faradharmony, the uh, cell death is decreased. Um, and instead, the cells move into the uh, S phase, which is this uh, DNA synthesis phase. Um, so this was significant. There's a 56% um, increase after 24 hours in the S phase. So next, I'll pass it to my colleague there who is to explain the conclusion and discussions. Um, as, as you can see for the conclusion, and uh, we are, we've been using this method, uh, which Mr. Tahiri predicted well, that the cell are, are acting differently when they are not in human body versus when they are. And uh, which is also uh, one of our, our next researchers to, to examine that and see how they behave in the primary cell rather than uh, uh, cell lines which are here. We are, uh, further experiments are ongoing to complete this study as an investigate the effect of different distances between the sample and the control on the result, evaluation of the CF effect on BAX and BCL-2 genes 
of treated cell and similar behavior analysis of other cancer cell lines and patient primary cells and comparing those results. This is, uh, this is ongoing and uh, it's, uh, the results are almost ready to be, to be submitted to, to other journals. And uh, it, it's worth mentioning that Mr. Muhammad Ali Tahiri has been, has been teaching uh, his, uh, uh, in, in classes for over 40 years and he has so many uh, publications and uh, uh, theories, which we talked about one of them here. Unfortunately, he was in prison for 10 years, but now uh, that he's back and uh, we are hopeful that we can continue our researches improving um, his theories. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one of his famous theories is uh, the, uh, the theory of consciousness bond, which means whenever we have, uh, we have a connection between the, 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 the whole consciousness with the, the consciousness of each, each individual uh, bodies, there will be, there will be um, repair and scanning in, in that body which is the, the basis of uh, Farad Armani and uh, Scientology, which, uh, which you, you can find the further uh, description of these two, Farad Armani and Scientology in our website, cosmointel.com. Besides, uh, you can look at all the books and publications of our, our, our group. And uh, also if you're interested, uh, we would love to hear from you uh, if you have any proposal, any research in this field, uh, we would love to hear from you. And uh, thanks, thank you for, thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Uh, Afshin and Azadeh, I'm pretty sure you, you guys are familiar with the whole thing, but I know there are some other questions around the world that you, you have heard from other people. Um, we can talk about that. Great. Thank you so much, Beruz and Nushin, for your interesting presentation. Uh, yeah, I would like to start with the, um, the question about connection. How is the connection established? And uh, also for make it uh, more tangible, what's the difference between the, this connection and also experiencing the present moment? So to begin with, you don't need to do anything to experience the connection. All you need to do be, is to be an observer, just to just observe what happens within your body, your mind, and whatever you feel. The, the only other thing you need is someone who has experienced it before. Uh, so you need some kind of starter through that person, and then you, you, can, you can do it on your own. But during the connection, you don't need to do anything, just be an observer. And your second question, what's the difference of uh, this connection, power harmony connection, for example, and the other um, methods like being, uh, feeling the present moment is, in general, this is a more comprehensive method. And we are using different consciousness fields, which like power harmony, uh, healing, being in a present moment is like branches of the, that whole uh, intelligence. So just to, to say it in other words, it's just more comprehensive. And in, in present moment is one of the, the branches you can, you can use. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, first of all, uh, I really appreciate you, Behruz, and uh, you for your great uh, presentation. Following uh, other question, I have another question. I want to know what's the difference between the method that you explain for our Dharmani consciousness field uh, and other mental techniques like as Zen, meditation, mindfulness, or some other techniques like as uh, this. So can you know what was the big difference or between mm -hmm. these methods and your, what you are talking about? Uh, yeah, the, the main difference is we, uh, in other methods, they are, they are relying on individual efforts and uh, background and uh, like how much you put effort in it and for how many years you've been doing that, that technique. But here in, in this approach, you don't need any of it. Basically, you don't have to do anything. And because of that, your background, your, your education, your, 
your race, your even your age doesn't matter. Since you don't want to do anything, you're just trying to be connected to the source of information in the world. Okay. So let me ask you another question because uh, during the presentation you mentioned flower ceremony and cymatology as a consciousness field that introduced by Dr. Tari. So I know that's a big question for other audience that is cymatology is the same as Scientology or is it a branch of Scientology or that's or is it something different? <laughs> yeah, we get that question a lot. Scientology is a, it is a different method and uh, Scientology doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, actually, Scientology is uh, a combination of psychomentology. And that is a word we, we created to, to show that this is, the, this is a branch of like uh, psychology, but we are using consciousness field in, in dealing with um, mental and uh, psychological issues. So I hope that I answered your question. Yeah, for sure. Yes, thanks a lot. So mm -hmm. I just asked uh, Azadeh to ask if she has, she has another question. Uh, yeah, my last question is about um, the main goal of your approach. Uh, actually, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to be clear, why do you conduct uh, scientific studies? Uh, I, I've seen so many different uh, methods and approaches. Most of them are, they're focusing on, on one thing, like being in the present moment or healing. But here it's beyond healing, beyond being in a present moment. It's getting to know yourself and human being as a whole to know what's the purpose of uh, our lives and uh, in, in this universe. By getting to know um, selves, we can, we can find out a better way of living. That's as a whole. And why scientific uh, conduct? Because uh, we've been called pseudoscience before and even nowadays, and we are trying to show the world that um, the, the way that science was uh, taught is you have matter and you have energy. And by, by introducing to the consciousness field, you can see, oh, there's, there's another thing. And they can convert to each other. And it's gonna be a, a whole new definition of science, uh, which in fact, Mr. Tyler called it science fact because there is something we can, we can do it in a laboratory. We can, we can repeat it by the procedures you can, you can find on our website. You can do it and it is repeatable. And what is, what is science? Something that you can repeat and get the same result again and again. And exactly. we are only trying to show that his theories are not just on paper, but actually you can, you can, uh, you can see it in, in, in a laboratory. Okay, okay, great. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. I think uh, we don't have much time. I wanted to, to thank you again for your time and all the audience that are watching us right now or later, uh, perhaps. Uh, again, if you have any questions or anything that uh, you, you have, please go to our website. We have a, uh, a form that you can fill out if you have any, any proposals again. Uh, please contact us and we would love to hear from you. Thank you all. I'm Ingrid Fredriksson, a Swedish author with a lot of books. A practical consciousness, the mysterious consciousness, the stress of consciousness, and the journey to life for that. I had a stroke 22 years ago. And here's the book. Or nitrogen. I want to talk about epigenetics. Epigenetic control, health, and disease, and consciousness influenced epigenetics. Epigenetics is very important. It's a mechanism that's regulating the gene activity. It depends which genes are turned on or turned off. I hope that all your good. And I really hope you will listen to my talk. Thank you.
I found the three theatre on the runstone in the park near Uppsala University, not far from the cathedral. It were nice to have three, and you can draw it without lifting the pen. Help a try. Welcome to my talk. Epinetics control health and disease and consonant influence epinetics. We are born as 100% human, but I am 10% human. Is it possible? Yes, it is. When we are newborn, we are quickly colonized by microorganisms from mother, vaginal, vessel, breast, etc. And at the age of three years, microbiota became stable and similar to that of a dog. Infants delivered by cesarean section typically show different microbial more commonly noted, associated with the skin. Oh, the common cell. With microtubules and everything. Human chromosomes. 40,000 times magnification. The photo is from Leonard Nilsson, a famous Swedish photographer who bought a waste a couple of years ago. Epinetics is a mechanism for regulating gene activity. Independent of DNA sequence, that determines which genes are turned on or off. In a particular type, in different disease states, in response to physiological and psychological stimulus. Epigenetics is today one of the very hottest areas when it comes to research. Genes are turned on and off by modification to the taste of its own, such as duration. Here are the tails, the stone tails, one for writers, one for writers, one for readers. There is a connection between the epinome and certain illness, including aging. Gut microbiota plays an important role in our lives and the way our bodies function. The composition of gut microbiota is unique. To children, just like our fingerprints. Our gut microbiota contains tens of trillions of bacteria, ten times more than cells in our body. During the winter 44-45, Nancy Dimoni blockades towns across western Netherlands, a period which became known as the Dutch Hunger Winter. Many decades later, scientific research found that the children born during this famine were underwhelmed and more likely to suffer from the food. What was most startling, however, was that these children's children were also born significantly underweight, despite never having an experience with a national insecurity during in this of offer. Researchers had concluded that the famine scattered the DNA of the victims, but it was only recently that they were able to correctly identify the scary as the penis. Scientists have made some incredible new discoveries in how our mind can literally affect our biology, especially through the study, study of the penis. The branch of science that looks how inherited shells of phenotype, a brand, or gene expression are caused by mechanisms other than shells in the underlying DNA. Instead of looking at DNA as the only factor controlling our biology, scientists are also looking at what actually controlling the DNA, which includes our thoughts and our feelings. Red cups, <laughs> a pup that is raised by an anxious, non nurturing mother becomes an anxious mother. But a pup that is raised by a relaxed, high nurturing mother becomes a relaxed mother. Some mother rats spend a lot of time licking, grooming, and nurturing the pup. Others seem to ignore the pups. Highly nurtured rat pups tend to grow up and become more docile. While rat pups who receive little nurturing plant tend to grow up and mess. It turns out that the difference between a calm and anxious rat is not genetic, it's epigenetic. The nurturing behavior of a mother rat during the first 
the of life shall surpass the pinnacle. And the epigenetic pattern that man established tends to take up even after the path to come again. We are used to think of inheritance in terms of the letters of DNA code that passes to us from uh, our parents. So right, that's fine. But the right little thing tells us there is another path to the optic DNA. So a licking burger, a mother rat can write in her shop information on her daughter. DNA in a way that completely bypasses that the form. In a sense, a Norton Bevel tells the pup something about the world that could have happened. Now, Bevel actually programmed the pup DNA in a way that will make them more likely to succeed. Oh, the very important Vargas nerve. A link between the gut and the brain. The vagus nerve is the body's vagus nerve, which connects the brain with all the vital organs in the body. I think it's important for which things autonom or which autonom. Many people say, you are what you eat. But your research says that when it comes to our DNA, you are what you feel. In a sense, here, start scientists have been exploring the effect that stress and emotions have on our cells, in particular, on our chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. What they have found is that our emotions can shape our physical reality at the molecular level. This may have a number of effects on our health and aging. Research shows how people with depression are at an increased risk to develop Asian related conditions. Scientists suspect this may be due to effects at the molecular level, such as shortening of the telomeres or change in the number of copies of mitochondria. Depression is associated with an increased mortality, mainly because of the excess, excess of suicide, but also the occurrence of vascular complication. Are we feeling ill because the neurotransmitters in the brain are low? Or are the neurotransmitters low because we feel bad? That's the question. Or lady in Sweden, Inger Bergström, got a brain tumor of the years of suffering in relation with a psychopath. She had a survey and she moved from her husband. After that, she has lived healthy and the rest of the tumor didn't grow on her. She has written a book about the situation. Om jag bara hade vetat, if I only had known. And she has taught people with the same disease how they have experienced their life before this. All people who have been abused physically or mentally as children and or as adults as all agree it's crucial to help. All of the people in the group who got the question if they have been sick physically ill in their destructive relationship answered yes. Nobody answered. It were more than seventy percent and they are all clear. It is the life situation and how we saw and feel if we will be healthy or ill. Men had also been abused to children. I was beaten from about the age of four as soon as I did not that my father don't want, a woman says. And she goes on with, I live in a constant tension. I have read this situation with people who are tortured. Marie Fredriksson, one part of Ruxet, has sold 75 music records all over the world. It's one of them who has been a boss of sin. The brain cancer took her life. But before she died, she managed to write about her situation so that people would know what she has converted causes for them. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for the music and thank, thank you for that at all.
But we know that the power of positive thinking can have amazing healing abilities. A recent study has said that positive thinking may actually affect, affect your DNA. Health is not just about what you're eating. It's also about what you're thinking and saying. And the most important of all, what you're feeling. Feeling is important. Many papers say you are what you eat. But new research says that when it comes to our DNA, you are what you eat. In recent years, scientists have been exploring the effects that stress and emotions have on ourselves, in particular in our chromosome and in the DNA. What they have found is that our emotions can shape our physical reality at the molecular level. This may have a number of effects on our health and healing. Epigenetic patterns are reversible. Thank you for listening. It makes me very happy to share with everyone. And I wish you all good luck. That you may have found through my presentation. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for coming to my talk. CRISPR Consciousness, Sustainably Bliss Engineering Life via Gene Therapy. My name is Mac Davis. I am a gene therapy scientist, activist, and CEO. And a personal goal of mine is the abolition of suffering for all sentient beings. For this reason, I'm here with you today to chronicle the state of global research on chronic pain gene therapy with the ultimate goal of sustainably engineering profound and novel bliss states which are compatible with the Darwinian evolutionary paradigm. And not only compatible, but I believe we will see more effectively competitive. So David Pierce is definitely one of my top two favorite philosophers of the modern era. As a youngster, browsing around in the dark philosophical underbelly of the internet, I stumbled across Heed Webb, The Hedonistic Imperative, and uh, Zero Ontology, uh, this network of websites that he created uh, that had extremely clear uh, and profound writing, which synthesized and integrated a lot of the craziest stuff that I had been thinking about the world as someone who came from a background wanting to be a physicist as a child, and then making my way uh, through philosophy and into uh, radical biochemistry, studying psychedelic drugs and gene therapy. So he was a philosopher or an intellectual that actually had this like framework of study that he had been studying for many decades before me. Anyway, I find his work to be extremely enthralling, and today, as a person who's actually committed to building the structure of the cosmos, many of the ideas that he first discussed as hugely ambitious but technically feasible are today within the realms of actualization. And now on to the technical portion of the talk. This is the central dogma of molecular biology which basically states that there are these three fundamental biopolymer substrates which have corresponding abstraction layers. Now the unique thing about DNA, RNA, and protein is that these biopolymer substrates don't only function as information storage mechanisms, but they're uniquely able to transduce the information out of one another and to express it into higher layers of abstraction, and sometimes vice versa. The one thing I want you to take away from this slide is the half-life section. The half-life of each of these substrates is crucially important to their potential in the context of therapeutic efficacy. So basically, what we see is if you inject RNA, it's going to have an effect that lasts for minutes. If you inject protein, it's going to have an effect that lasts for 30 minutes to maybe 10 hours. But if you transform your DNA, it could last you your whole life. So that was in 1950. Today, in 2020, this is what the same chart looks like. 
What I see here is that we are on a path of a deepening expansion of our understanding of the objective correlates of self-identity. And with a deeper understanding of these biochemical correlates, we can consciously create a more expansive, beautiful, and healthy manifold for consciousness to continually manifest and grow. I would like to present three controversial dualities to help us understand what gene therapy is and what it means for us. The first duality of gene transfer is horizontal versus vertical. Vertical gene transfer typically transfers a lot of information. We're talking about an entire organism cloning itself, all of its genetic code. In other cases, vertical gene transfer happens through sexual reproduction, where two organisms of the same species take all of their chromosomes and mix them together and recombine it to basically birth an entire new organism that has some attributes of both of the parent organisms. Although microorganisms appear to use horizontal gene transfer to enhance the evolutionary fitness of the species, multicellular organisms appear to have lost that ability. In the human journey towards longer lifespans and lower birth rates, the rate at which we can upgrade our genomes naturally has been decreasing, even in a world of accelerating change. What we're doing through gene therapy is introducing the first conscious and intentional form of horizontal gene transfer for humans. This is a new type of evolution. We are entering an era where your genome and perhaps the genome of the species can be upgraded and enhanced. Which leads us to our next duality, treatment versus enhancement. Here are two examples. The first treatment gene therapy that I can think of is one that I'm working on, a cure for HIV. In 2017, the NIH discovered a broadly neutralizing antibody for HIV circulating in the blood of a very special human who had a powerful natural immunity to HIV. The researchers extracted the genetic code required to produce the antibody, and this code, when transformed into other humans, allows the same antibody to be produced. This could be perceived as a treatment for HIV, but I think injecting this type of information into an otherwise healthy person, conferring immunity to HIV, or perhaps other sexually transmitted diseases like herpes simplex, could be perceived as an enhancement. Another example of the treatment versus enhancement question is folostatin. Folostatin gene therapy in animals has been shown to extend lifespan of animals by up to 25%. Not only that, but in every animal model it's been tested in has showed a doubling of muscle mass and bone density and a halving of body fat from a single injection with no negative side effects. A phase two human trial for muscular dystrophy has shown great results with no negative side effects for folostatin gene therapy. So this is potentially a human enhancement that could be beneficial for all, as well as a treatment for rare muscle disease like muscular dystrophy and ALS. I think one big difference that we will see in the next part of this talk is that treatments by nature benefit a small population of individuals. Enhancements by nature could benefit anyone. Here we have vectors. These are the fundamental substrates of gene therapy. The two types of vectors are viral and plasmid. Now, viruses are basically just plasmids but the, some of the plasmid data self-encodes a elaborate protein crystalline encapsulation matrix. The encapsulation matrix allows the gene to have special properties like tissue selectivity um, and also potential like protection from immune systems. Of great note is the price differential. I have included the approximate marginal cost of a single human dose. The capital expenditure required to produce a functional human dose of a viral gene therapy is outside of the realm of most households or small businesses. However, plasmid gene therapy, the costs of startup and the techniques involved are definitely within that of the home user or the small business. Anybody today could spin up a plasmid gene therapy uh, development lab 
for a very low cost. Another fundamental difference between plasmid and viral gene therapy is that plasmid gene therapy, um, the information is embedded in the episome of the cell. And in viral gene therapy, the virus generally inserts itself into the host chromosome. What this means is that plasmid gene therapy is generally not heritable, and it does not directly affect your existing DNA. It doesn't actually edit your existing DNA. It adds what basically amounts to a new nanochromosome. The plasmid sits inside the nucleus bound to perhaps the scaffold matrix and expresses the information that it's meant to. Because of this, plasmids generally express for a shorter time than viruses do, but this is not always the case. One problem with editing chromosomal DNA is that there is always a minor chance of an off-target edit, an off-target interaction, that could accidentally destroy another gene or result in cancer. That said, chromosomal DNA editing, the effects generally last much longer and are more permanent. On the other hand, you might not want the effects to be permanent because we're still in the realm of uh, prototyping essentially these new gene therapies. And if you get the dose wrong or it doesn't work out, if you already inserted it into your chromosome, you can't take that information out. Finally, as scientific research ebbed and flowed, it happened to be the case that there are at least two types of viral vectors that are currently FDA and EMA approved for treatment of disease, while at the same time there are no plasmids that are currently fully approved. On to the juiciest bit of the presentation, the discussion of genetic targets. So these are listed in an order from the first being the most well understood and probably possibly the least uh, helpful to the majority of people. And as, as we go down the list, uh, these targets are less well understood and potentially more helpful to more people. The first target is sodium channel 1.7 deletion. The name of the gene is actually SCN9A. And this is the most well-known type of congenital insensitivity to pain. Generally, people that are born with this mutation or gene deletion uh, suffer greatly from it because they do not have access to very important information um, that would ensure their health and survival. So the reason that this is still a gene therapy that could benefit somebody is basically when you have a terminal cancer patient or another type of terminal patient where the pain is effectively totally pointless, um, the idea would be to just completely remove their ability to feel pain at all. Navega Therapeutics is a startup located in San Diego, California, and uh, what they're currently working on is, uh, I believe, an intrathecal or a spinal infusion of AAV, possibly AAV9, which contains a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, payload that is intended to delete SCN9A from uh, all of the neurons in the spinal cord. So this is probably totally going to work. The second startup that I'm aware of that is in the chronic pain gene therapy space is uh, Zelud. I'm not sure 100% how to say this. Therapeutics. The original scientists, I believe, are based in Boulder, Colorado. There's this really, really cool uh, experimental neurology lab where they were injecting these dogs' spinal cords with plasmids that were coding for the expression of interleukin-10, which is a cytokine, and they were finding that these plasmids, when infused into the spinal cord neurons, 
had long-term expression and the dog's quality of life was significantly improved after spinal injury. So Zalud is at the point where they're at phase 2b clinical trials for uh, osteoarthritis as an indication, uh, even though they really started out as a uh, neuropathic chronic pain focused business as far as I know. Opioids are currently the best way that we have of treating chronic pain, and they can be delivered through gene therapy. The great thing about opioid gene therapy is that it completely gets around the problems associated with being dependent on an exogenous source of small molecules harvested from drug distribution networks. A single injection of an opioid gene therapy can give you a constant drip that can last you 1-10 to 10 years, completely bypassing the waves of dosing and withdrawal. For chronic pain patients who are constantly dealing with changing policy landscapes that put their needs last, this changes everything. The first ever chronic pain gene therapy trial in the world occurred at the University of Michigan by Dr. Fink and I believe his wife. Uh, they got pre-pro encephalin, which is one of the many types of endorphin natural opioid peptides that are produced in humans and they encoded it inside a herpes virus. Now they used herpes because you can inject herpes subcutaneously or even you know, probably just at the mucous membrane and the virus very, very quickly accumulates into the nerve cells and especially nerve cells in the spine and in the genitals. So this is where you want the endorphins to be produced. And the trial was in my understanding, very successful. It was for uh, chronic pain patients, and it was completed a, a couple of years ago. These last two slides are notable for likely being essentially architectural approaches to cultivating body-mind activation pathways, which wisdom traditions for millennia have studied. Tantra and Zen practices are reminders of the way to bliss, wholeness, harmony, and a more spacious and welcoming sense of existence. Ananda, in the Hindu Vedas, Upanishads, and the Bhagavad Gita, signifies eternal bliss which accompanies the ending of the rebirth cycle. Those who renounce the fruits of their actions and submit themselves completely to the divine will arrive at the final termination of the cyclical life process of samsara to enjoy eternal bliss and perfect union with the Godhead. Anandamide is a molecule associated with these bliss states. High anandamide levels are associated with fear extinction and a general loss of anxiety, depression, and pain. Anandamide is a very sensitive molecule with a very short half-life in most people. But a 2019 British Journal of Anesthesia case report reported a person named Joe Cameron who was described as having been born with a unique mutation in her anandamide genes. She has gone her whole life experiencing information-sensitive gradients of bliss rather than pain. She can still feel cuts, burns, and scrapes, but they don't hurt. She said that pregnancy felt like a tickle, and now even though she's in her late 70s and has been diagnosed with severe arthritis, she experiences very little discomfort from it. This is a gene which we can conceivably inject into other people, just like the way we could transfer genes conferring immunity to HIV. I would love to try out the anandamide gene myself, and this may be an important first step in the journey to abolishing suffering and healing from the brutalities of Darwinian evolution. This last target is perhaps the most profound. The 5-HT7 receptor is a serotonin receptor which has been implicated by Tom Ray as the most powerful mediator of the depth of consciousness and the spaciousness of self. Traditional practices like transcendental meditation and the administration of DMT have been shown to enhance 5-HT7 modulation, but for the first time it appears there may be a gene therapy which could elevate one's baseline. 5-HT7 small molecules are currently pain research candidates at Esteve, a Spanish pharmaceutical company. The idea being that when the depth and spaciousness of your conscious embrace is widened, perhaps in some cases even to an oceanic or a cosmic level of expansion, even extreme pain becomes easier to feel and can no longer be overwhelming suffering. Pain as real and deeply felt, but without experiencing suffering. This may be what 
5-HT7 receptor modulation can offer us. If you found this research compelling or are interested in collaboration on the anandamide gene therapy or other gene therapies, please reach out to me. I'm Mac Davis, and thank you for coming to my talk at Consciousness 2020. Hope to see you next year.